Season tickets for the 2020-21 Menor Icebreaker season are now on sale. Fans can take advantage of the best pricing on games as well as a variety of benefits all season long by becoming a season ticket holder. Home dates for the upcoming season are still being finalized, but the Federal Prospects Hockey League has announced it will return to play on December 18th. The Icebreakers will have a minimum of 23 home games this season. Until the schedule is finalized, fans can make a deposit on their seats. The remaining balance will be collected following the schedule's release. All season ticket holders will be issued a season pass at a private event ahead of the start of the season, and fans can also pick up their passes at the arena if they are unable to attend. Some really exciting benefits this season for uh, all season ticket holders. 10% off the face value of each ticket. 10% off all Icebreakers merchandise. Uh, that private pickup event at the beginning of the season. And then all season ticket holders this season will get a special gift on opening night. So head on over to mentoricebreakers.com slash season tickets to reserve your seats. <laughs> From the corner of Munson and Civic Center Boulevard, I'm Angelo Vallada, joined alongside by Jared Tennant for the next episode of Into the Depths with the Men Are Icebreakers. And uh, we got a really jam-packed episode for you today. We're going to catch up with two new signees as players, Marcus Ortiz and Nick Treffery. Front office feature with Director of Sales Tim Walker and Fan Mailbox with General Manager and Director of Hockey Operations Nick Russo. And I think you'll find those two interviews with uh, Marcus and with Nick, it really kind of sh- gives you a look at some of the guys we're bringing in, just the maturity. And they're two very well-spoken guys, and it really shows in those interviews. So we'll talk about it later, uh, especially with general manager Nick Russo, but no schedule officially yet, a little over a month from the anticipated start date, which is December 18th. Uh, Fanatics and all the other teams in the league just kind of waiting with bated breath. And we wish we could do a schedule release for you, and we will once that's possible. But as of right now, there's too many uh, too many curveballs, too many things up in the air to dive into that. Just know that the start date is still officially for the uh, 18th of December, barring any change, TBD. And obviously there is, like a schedule exists, it's just not official, not released to the public yet. Um, of course, that December 18th date is still the target. And it's going to continue to be the target, hopefully. I mean, I'm staying optimistic. So even though it was on the port here on Prowler's fan page, the mascot tournament came to a close last night, which had the most votes for both the winner and the uh, runner-up. And Winston-Salem, uh, Winston and Salem, the two Thunderbirds, won over Mitz the Cougar for the port here on Prowler's. So that mascot tournament we've uh, followed throughout the time was won by the Thunderbirds, just to throw that out there. But back here, closer to home, the Icebreakers uh, searching for a second goalie and possibly could be someone we talked to last episode in Brendan Colgan, who is now going to camp with the make and mayhem of the SPHL. Now, of course, Colgan would be a really good candidate for that second uh, goaltender spot after Jake Mullen, but then you look around, there's tons of options if Colgan either makes the team in Macon or doesn't end up making the team here, just depending on whatever happens. Um, you know, look right here in the FPHL. Watertown has nine goalies right now on their roster, and among those nine goalies, there's plenty of guys that have already played in this league and had success. I mean, just to name a couple of names, um, it'd be Jeremy Pollenville, Nick Nieder, Mike Constantino, Michael Stiliadis. Those are just some of the names of guys that have had success in this league and have proven they can play at this level. Yeah, as it stands right now, there are 57 players on their contract. Likely significantly less will be at the main training camp as the final roster size needs to be whittled down to 25 players. So we'll see. It'll be an interesting uh, month and a lot of decisions coming up for the front office of the men or icebreakers as far as the official roster being set. Yeah, I know we talked to uh, Sebastian Ragno last episode just talking about how the strategy kind of evolved as the offseason went on and all these different uh, constantly changing situations going on. But I think a lot of those guys under contract are not going to end up making the team, obviously, just because, you know, all of a sudden there's all this SPHL talent, higher level talent available, and that kind of unfortunately has to push somebody else out of a job. So, you know, as you said, right now, 57 guys under contract. I think we could probably expect 35 or 40 to report to the main camp and 
that obviously be cut down to that 25-man roster before that December 18th opener. And that main camp will be in the first week of December. We're getting there. It's crazy to think Thanksgiving in a couple weeks, Christmas right after, and hopefully the FPHL start of the season and opening puck drop sandwiched in between. But uh, we'll, we'll wait and see and find out where that goes for the Icebreakers and the rest of the FPHL. A lot of excitement here in this just over a month before the anticipated start of the season. I think it is important to note uh, regarding the roster that you know that 25-man roster obviously is what it's going to be on opening day. But there also is that possibility that maybe a couple extra guys will stick around and you know just in case of an injury, maybe sign with the team, sign sign on a PTO. You look at the first season uh, here in Manor, Von Clausen was a guy who didn't make the initial roster, but he stuck around and helped out um, you know part time as an equipment manager, and then ended up getting signed and did pretty well for himself here in Manor. Yeah, the Icebreakers have a lot of players. There's some returning players. There's the new guys. Then there's the guys from the leagues maybe coming down. Uh, then the guys who came in at the end of last season. And then the ones that were there at the beginning of last season. So a big mix of talent pool. It'll be interesting to see how it all comes together and fits the puzzle. And, uh, yeah, before we get into the interviews, and we're going to start off by talking with Marcus Ortiz, who signed with the team about half a month ago, and uh, be a great interview with Marcus, and we thank him for joining us. I want to tell you about a new sponsor for uh, Into the Depths with the Men and Icebreakers, and it is Homelight. Are you looking to sell your home and not sure where to start? Try contacting Homelight, a company who crunches the numbers for you to determine which real estate agent or which instant offer will you get you the most money for your home. To learn more, give them a call at 888-998-998. 1909 and visit them at www.homelight.com. Koozies, pint glasses, coasters, shot glasses, golf balls, and even cornhole boards are all available at mentoricebreakers.com. Click the team store tab and check out all of the new official team merchandise, plus all of the hoodies, hats, t shirts, plush, pennants, and more. All right, with us now is one of the newest men or icebreakers to sign with the team. He officially signed with the team back on Wednesday, October 21st. A live signing right here in the men or icebreakers team office with head coach Sebastian Ragno and general manager and director of hockey operations, Nick Russo. And it's the Garland, Texas native Marcus Ortiz. Marcus, thanks so much for joining us here today on Into the Depths. Thank you guys for having me. Yeah, a little bit of... Uh, background, uh, Marcus has played in the ECHL for the Rapid City Rush, played on three different squads in the SPHL, the Knoxville Ice Bears, Macon Mayhem, and most recently, the Roanoke Rail Yard Dogs. And one thing, we're going to have a great interview with Marcus. Uh, Jared and I have some questions for him, and be great for the Fanatics to get to know one of the newest talented members of the team and look forward to seeing him on the ice, but also... Uh, another reason you want to get this brand new Men or Icebreakers collectible keepsake that's coming out is we have an in-depth player interview feature with Marcus. So, Marcus, uh, we got a lot of great questions for you and happy to have you on. Uh, what's your offseason been like? Because at this point, you know, you would have normally been started in some season by now. Oh, it's been crazy. Um, you know, just going to the gym constantly. Um, I kind of had a feeling that we weren't going to start anywhere near on time, so... I just started skating probably maybe over just a month ago. Um, just been in the gym. At, other than that, for the most part, um, he actually caught me. Well, this morning I went to the gym, and then now I'm in between. I came home for a little bit to do this interview, eat some food, and then I'm going to get on the ice before I work here a little bit later. I like that dedication. Uh, yeah, it's hard to stay motivated right now, right about now, but. At least the finish line's in sight right now, hopefully. So you're a guy that has just a ton of pro games underneath your belt and not really somebody who would be here under normal circumstances with your kind of experience. So how do you kind of plan on bringing that veteran knowledge and experience to some of the younger guys here in Mentor? Well, I, I think you're going to see a, a, a much um, – a, a better brand of hockey this year because of everything that's gone on because there's five teams not playing in the Southern professional league because there's a handful of teams not playing in the ECHL this year. Um, you know, I think it's only going to benefit hockey fans and hockey players everywhere. Um, I mean, as far as me going to mentor or me coming to mentor this year, um, 
you know, just like any other year, I, I would, I, I want to win obviously. Um, but you know, I also, uh, just hope that, um, I could show some of the young guys, uh, you know, the guys who haven't gotten that experience yet, haven't gotten a chance to move up in the ranks, uh, just how to properly go about your day-to-day -day life and take care of yourself when, and how to approach, um, you know, being a pro and going to the rink and, pra and, you know, getting the most out of practice and, you know, putting in the extra work and all the little things that it does, you know, take to get and stick in that next level. Yeah, it was really fun catching up with, uh, or again, talking with Marcus Ortiz with you the other day on your whole journey, um, you know, from youth hockey through professional now. But what's been your favorite stop of your pro career so far? Um, so far, that's tough. There's, uh, there's a lot to like about everywhere I've been. Um, Rapid City was my first, my first home as a professional hockey player. So, uh, you know, I fell in love with it and the people there and then, spent quite a, quite a lot of time in Knoxville and that's actually my home now. Um, so, you know, it's hard to say that that's not my favorite place. Um, I mean, it's everywhere I've gone, I've, I've met and not only met, but met and kept in touch with a lot of great fans and booster club members. And I mean, there's a lot to like every, what I like about everywhere I've been. Um, you know, I guess, I guess I'd have to say Knoxville because it's my home now and some people might get mad at me if I don't say that. <laughs> Just wanted to get your thoughts on uh, Coach Ragno and our GM, Nick Russo. What was kind of your first impression meeting those two here in Mentor? Oh, they were very welcoming. Um, you know, for, first and foremost, they wanted me to feel comfortable. They wanted me to feel at home. Um, you know, a couple guys that you could really, really tell care about their hockey program and, and turning, this, uh, turning this mentor program around, um, you know, um, from what, from what I had seen and, and heard it, uh, you know, it's gone through a lot in the past couple, couple of years since they came into the league, but, um, you know, just based on my, my short visit there and my interactions with, uh, Mr. Russo and, and coach Ragno, it's, uh, you know, they're doing everything that they can to change it. It's just about what, what the guys in the locker room choose to do with it. Um, you know, you, you we have to make the most of it and, and those guys are, are putting, putting everything they can forth in front of us to, to help us be successful before we even hit the ice. So, um, yeah, they're, they're very welcoming and incredible guys. And, you know, it's, I, I honestly, if, if it wasn't for the two of those guys, I probably, I probably would have felt a little uncomfortable with signing, but after talking to both of them, I, it, it was, if it was completely the right decision. Yeah. That's a great way of putting it where you say, when the coach and management, uh, you know, they have the right vision, the right focus, and then it takes the locker room to do their part. It really is, uh, you know, like a, a big puzzle and all the pieces have to come together. So I think that's a great way uh, of looking at it. Now, you touched on this a little bit earlier, um, but what are some of your goals for the season from scoring goals to being a part of the locker room, a key integral part of that uh, locker room with your, your veteran leadership? There's a lot you have to offer this team. So what, what would you say your goals are overall? Um, well, I mean, you know, every, I, th I think you'd be stupid to, to say, uh, that any hockey player professionally and any high level doesn't have a statistical goal in mind for the year. Um, but, uh, a little, a little more important than those st statistical goals, sorry, a little bit of dyslexic coming out of me, um, is, uh, just like I said, making that impact on, on those younger guys, you know, showing them that day in day out, you have to be, a, you have to be willing to, you know, not only use your skill, not only be a skilled player, but you have to be a hard nosed player nowadays. Um, you know, in order to be effective and, and, you know, something that, you know, ultimately got me into the ECHL and then I got away from it and it got me quickly out of the ECHL is, you know, even when you're even when you're having success, even when you are scoring goals and doing all those things, you still have to play with the net. You still have to be a, a a physical uh, and effective player out there. Um, you know, this isn't the NHL and, you know, guys can't get away with not being physical at, at, at a, at this kind of level. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's busy. These minor professional levels are more demanding than the NHL because it's, it's a much more physical game. And in order for your team to be effective, every guy has to be willing to do that and pay that price. And when you have a team full of guys that is willing to do that, then, you know, you're, you're, you're looking a lot better in the win column because your team's willing, everybody on your team's willing to do that 
and thus every every guy is willing to sacrifice. Um, so I think touching back on the goals, I think it's just important to uh, you know set the tone right away and you know this you know display that kind of hard work. And ultimately, in the first first few games, you know I think I think everybody will be able to tell quick, pretty quickly uh, what kind of player I am. And um, you know I I can shoot the puck really well, but more so than that, um, you know I I can I can be a physical force while being an offensive force at the same time. So it's, uh, it's all about passion. Um, is that, that is, at least that's what I think. Um, you know, I, I play with passion. I live with passion. And I think if you don't play with passion, then you should, you're at the, you're at the wrong level at this point. So, um, I hope to, you know, bring that out of every guy that's in that locker room because, you know, there's going to be good times. There's going to be bad times, sometimes bad or more, more, more prominent than good but if if you find a way to play with if you can play with passion every time you're on the ice you'll find a way to have have good nights every almost every night so um you know bringing that out of the guys in the locker room and on the ice i think will be um a big goal for me that was very well said marcus maybe at some point uh i know you've done some coaching with you cocky but maybe you'll move up and do some coaching after all that that was a good speech (laughs) <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Just wanted to get your thoughts on kind of the overall level of play in the FPHL this season. I know you touched on this earlier a little bit, but with just so many SPHL guys starting to find new homes, some of them finding new FPHL teams, it's, it's kind of shaping up to be a much faster and much more skilled league than it has been. Well, absolutely. I mean, you know, the, the lack of jobs at the, at the level above and the level above that is, is absolutely astounding this year. So, I think you're going to see pretty much the SPHL here in the, in the FPHL this year. Um, and a lot of my buddies are signing on different teams. Um, you know, we're all kind of thinking the same thing. We, we all want, you know, job security and we all just want to play this year. I mean, with everything going on and how short, how short the the year was cut last year with COVID and everything else that left, you know, hundreds of college hockey players on the table that hadn't played their game, played a game of pro yet. And, you know, this year you got another hundred, hundred or so more that are looking to play, jump to pro. So, I mean, for us this year as a veteran player, it's about play. It's just about playing. Um, and you know, a lot of my buddies that I'm seeing on signing on other teams, if you know, they they kind of reciprocate that message. And I mean, at the end of the day, this is you know, we get we get paid not millions of dollars, but we get paid we get paid to play the game that we love. So. Um, you know, any chance we can get to play is, is important. And this year is exactly, you're seeing that with all these roster changes and all the guys that you see with all these, uh, you know, good pro hockey resumes, you know, moving down and, and moving here and moving there in the leagues, just, you know, looking for a place to play. Um, and ultimately I think it's going to benefit the fans if we hopefully can have some, um, you know, it's going to, it's going to ultimately benefit them. They're going to get to see a, a much more, a much, I'm not going to say much more, but you know, uh, a much higher level of, of skill and speed than probably they saw last year. Again, we're talking with Marcus Ortiz, one of the newest men or icebreaker signees. And you got to spend 18 games with the Roanoke Rail Yard Dogs last season, where former icebreaker Austin Rodebush played very well down the stretch. And did you get to know him during your time down there? And how impressive was his play? Because I know he even won uh, an SPHL Player of the Week award uh, for a very strong stint of playing down there in the net for the Rail Yard Dogs. Oh yeah, I got to meet Rody. He was uh, he was a phenomenal guy, phenomenal uh, human being, uh, next level work ethic. Uh, yeah, he and I we actually sat pretty close to each other in the locker room, so we always were uh, were screwing around in our little corner of the locker room. Um, yeah, he's a he's a fantastic guy. Uh, again, couldn't be more deserving of the Player of the Week and Co-Player of the Week uh, honors he got while he was down there. Um, he gave us a chance to win every game and, you know, he, he has, he has and always does have the best attitude and, um, you know, just a funny guy and a great guy to be around. And, you know, uh, we, we hit it off pretty quickly once we met. Um, and, uh, yeah, he's, <laughs> he's something else, Rody. So I know you're a Texas guy and a guy who's played in the SPHL a lot, but have you, have you ever played in Ohio before at any level in your career? 
Uh, yeah, so I play. I used to play against the, the junior blue jacket, uh, the blue jackets, and then the uh, the barons. Where both of those were in my AAA league when I was growing up. So I I came to I came to I think went to Columbus I think twice. What's your what was your first impression of uh, men are in Northeast Ohio? And when you signed here back in mid October, was that the first time you had been in this area? Oh, a hundred percent. First time I've ever been to mentor. Um, it's, it's beautiful. Uh, from what I saw just quickly driving through it's, I mean, it's, it's a big, big city atmosphere, small, small city scale. Um, which I like, uh, I don't have to sit in traffic for hours, what it looked like. So <laughs> that's always nice, but it was, uh, it was awesome. Um, had a lot more, restaurants and activities around that than I probably expected think because when you when I thought mentor I was like oh it's probably a really small town and then I got here and I was like well it's not that small yeah would you believe we have close to 300 restaurants and just mentor alone no I, I can't I wouldn't believe that that's that's crazy <laughs> It's a That's nice awesome little man. town. And, and when you have days like this, you know, we don't have the Texas weather all year long. But uh, when you get this mid November and the sun's shining and 65, 70 degrees, you know, it's perfect. Yeah, it kind of scares me, though. I have a feeling when we get there in, uh, in the <laughs> beginning of December, we might get hit with a ton of snow. Well, you know, they say snow shoveling is a great workout. Yeah, I think I'll just let my tires spin for a little while. But... <laughs> that works, too. I'll call somebody to come pull my truck out of a hole. So we're going to go ahead and just name a few different categories and have you name your favorite in that category. So All first right. thing we have is just favorite food. Anything Mexican. And there's probably about uh, 15 different Mexican restaurants in Mineral Ohio. Uh, how about favorite movie? Ooh. Ace Ventura. Favorite music genre? Ooh. Thai rap and country. How about place to visit, whether on vacation or just to, you know, stop by frequently? Uh, any beach. Uh, sport to watch. Hockey, for sure. <laughs> yeah, we, we learned all about your favorite teams. Now, most people would guess Dallas Stars, but when they read that article in the, uh, the keepsake with you, they'll learn how you became a Vegas Golden Knight fan as well. Oh, yeah. Uh, how about favorite animal? Uh, Lions. Favorite athlete? Mike Medano. Favorite hobby? Golfing. And then your favorite holiday? Oh, Christmas, of course. Yeah, that's coming up here and hard to believe just about a month. But to wrap things up, and we really appreciate you taking the time, uh, Marcus, to talk to us today. Uh, but anything that you'd like to say to the Icebreaker fans out there? Uh, yeah, just stay safe. Uh, keep your fingers crossed that we can start on time. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm eager to get down there. I'm counting down the days till I'm supposed to be moving down and I'm eager to get down there and get to work. So everybody stay safe so we can hopefully do that. And hopefully we can have some fans in the stands too. Well, thanks a lot, Marcus Ortiz, for joining us here today on Into the Depths. And we really look forward to seeing you out there on the ice and hopefully just about a little over a month. Awesome, awesome. Looking forward to it. Let's hope so. All right, take care, Marcus. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. Looking for a way to keep your child connected with the Icebreakers this hockey season? The team will be offering one-hour youth enhancement sessions every Wednesday at 1 p.m. at Menor Ice Arena from October 7th through December 16th. Sessions will be led by Icebreakers coaches and players and focus on enhancing the skills of each player in attendance. Sessions are open to youth hockey players of any age, and players will be divided into groups based on age and skill level. For more information and to register, visit mentoricebreakers.com slash enhancement. All right, now we are joined alongside one of the newest Mentor Icebreakers picked up in the Motor City Rockers uh, dispersal draft, and it's defenseman Nick Treffery. And Nick, thanks for joining us here today on Into the Depths. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me, guys. So, uh, well, 
that was a different kind of experience. You know, you, your off season has been a little different maybe than most, even though everybody's had kind of a crazy one, but a bit of a roller coaster. You thought you were going to motor city, then they go dormant. And eventually you're selected by the icebreakers with the first picked in the uh, rockers dispersal draft. So what has this off season been like for you? Oh, it's, uh, it's been a little bit all over the place. I mean, trying to find a home has been, uh, one of the biggest issues, but, uh, Overall, I mean, just having trust and understanding that I could find a spot where I'm welcome and find a good program where I can fit in and be a part of the team on and off the ice is uh, something I was happy for. And it seems like overall, a lot of those ACHA D1 guys, NCAA D3 players, they found some pretty good success at the FPHL level, uh, including some former icebreakers. So what do you think you need to do to kind of have that same success with the experience that you have at both those levels? No, the biggest, the biggest thing for me is just setting the tone. Um, I've always been one to set the pace right off the bat and come out, have a good couple of hits and really set the pace of the game. Um, a lot of, a lot of that has to do with just how I grew up. I mean, I've always been in a very high pace environment and if you start off slow, then you can't really do anything uh, throughout the rest of the game. So starting off fast is uh, what's going to help me translate the best. Yeah, you know, taking a look at uh, just your stature, you come in 6'3", 229 uh, as a defenseman. Great size, bring a lot of physicality um, beyond your physical size, which, you know, is impressive and definitely well needed for the Icebreakers back line. But what, what else do you bring back there for the back line of the guys in double blue? I've, uh, I've always been confident in my ability to slow the game down and have a good hockey sense, make the good first pass and be able to get the play moving forward to where it needs to go and get it out of the zone and just be a shutdown defenseman. And if, uh, if the team needs me offensively, then that's something I've always been able to do as well. Um, biggest thing first is protecting our net. So that's, uh, that's what I think I can bring is just solid defense on the back end and hopefully a little bit of offense on the front end. So you're a guy who's from California. So how did you end up playing college hockey in the Midwest in Wisconsin and Indiana? Um, that's kind of hard. I mean, my entire life, I've kind of been all over the place. Uh, I moved to Canada when I was 17 and uh, Henry Berger and I have been playing together since we were six years old. So him and I uh, can't seem to uh, stop going to the same spot, <laughs> but uh, that's cool. Yeah, it's, it's actually, it's really fortunate. I mean, we played on our first team together. So that was, uh, it's kind of cool to see us going from our first team to pro teams together. Um, but overall, I moved to Canada when I was 15, uh, played in three different spots, including Montana, where I finished out my junior career, which is uh, where I got picked up by Northland College, where I again ended up playing with Henry. Um, so I played there for three years. Uh, Things didn't work out quite the way I was hoping up there in Wisconsin. Uh, I figured I'd have a more fortunate opportunity down in Indiana Tech in Fort Wayne. And uh, I was fortunate. I mean, I, I moved down there and uh, got things started right off the bat. We ended up winning a national title. And I don't know, I've always, I've always been one to kind of jump in with both feet and kind of hope for the best. So just yeah, it's it's awesome. Uh, everywhere. Well, well, before we move on, I want to touch up with that uh, question is, uh, what was that like winning, winning the national title at Indiana Tech? It was something you can't really translate into a sentence. I mean, it's, it's pure elation. It's emotion. I mean, there's, there's nothing you can really do to describe it. I mean, when, when, I, when that final buzzer went off, I was on the ice and I turned around, tried to take my helmet off and ended up choking myself with my own chin strap. I mean, you don't, you're, not, you're not really thinking. You're, it's just pure excitement and just love for your entire team, knowing that you spent the entire year working towards this one goal and you were finally able to reach it. And having that experience, you, you always want to get back to that. So sometimes you get that taste of it and you, now you have that hunger all the way up your whole career. You'll have that. You'll remember it. You'll want it again. Oh, absolutely. I mean, have, having that one season has really set the tone for where I want to, like what I want to do and where I want to be with the program you know, I want to win. And that's what I'm hoping to do here in mentor. I know that's what the fanatics want. We want 
a chance at the commissioner's cup, but, you know, we're on pace to make the playoffs last year, but uh, season got cut short. So anxious to get going here, but speaking about being a mentor, did you know anything about mentor in Northeast Ohio before getting drafted here or your first impressions of the city? I, I don't know if you've been here yet or not, but uh, tell us a little bit about how you're feeling. I'm excited. Um, I've always, I, I mean, I've always been one to love the Midwest, which is weird from me being from California and stuff like that, but I've always been a big outdoorsman. Um, but I mean, I knew a little bit here and there from past teammates that I've had that have played here. Um, I knew what it was, I knew what they did, I knew what they were about. Um, but overall, I mean, I, I've only heard great things about the program and I'm really excited to, uh, get to get a chance to be a part of this family that's coming together and hoping to uh, create something special here. So what do you think you're looking forward to the most about this upcoming season? A fresh start. I mean, I've always, uh, I've always been one to be ex like be excited about a restart, a clean slate and being able to, I mean, like I said earlier, set the pace, set the tone and uh, hopefully create, something special out of uh, my pro career. And, you know, I'm, there's not really too many expectations. I mean, with a clean slate, I can set it higher. I can set it low. And if I set it low, there's only moving forward. Any goals for the upcoming year with that fresh start, you know, any personal goals that you have on or on the ice? Uh, personal goals for myself. I mean, I've always been one to set the bar really high for myself. Um, but I'd say as far as goals go, I mean, just trying to help out the team as much as possible um, on and off the ice. I've, you know, I've always been one to put the team before myself. Um, so my, my personal goal, I guess it would be just being able to be that situation guy to where if they need me in a certain situation that I can be out there and I can go and succeed in that situation. So it's kind of a really weird situation this year with the whole dispersal draft, uh, just because next season we're not going to have your rights to go back to Motor City. So just any thoughts that you have on just going number one in that dispersal draft and then just the whole uniqueness of the situation of us only having, it's like a rental almost. <laughs> it's, uh, it's definitely unique. It's a fortunate decision because a lot of guys that are playing right now don't have a home. I mean, a lot of guys can't play with the SPHL shutting down half their league all those guys, they're they're looking for somewhere to play, and a lot of guys don't have that opportunity to be able to play this season. So I'm more – I feel more fortunate than anything else. Um, I'm happy that I have a home. I'm happy that I have a place to play, and uh, hopefully I can uh, set something for the future. And, you know, if, uh, if I end up going back to Motor City and they stay dormant, then uh, hopefully I can find my way back here. Yeah, it's great to have that spirit of gratitude, too. I mean, like you said, half the SPHL, some of the ECHL squads, and I think there will be a lot of spirited play on the ice in the FPHL when it hopefully starts in just over a month because guys are going to just be happy to be out there. So that's a great way of looking at it that you said. Uh, now we're going to kind of have just a little bit of fun, and uh, we got some this or that questions for you. So just you'll have two choices just for some fun, and uh, you tell us which one that uh, you prefer. And again, we're talking with Nick Treffery, uh, pick number one in the Motor City Rockers dispersal draft coming to the Menor Icebreakers for the year. Uh, so cats or dogs? I'm a big dog guy. Um, I've always, I've always loved dogs. I had dogs growing up. Um, unfortunately, I haven't ha been able to have one since I was about 14 or 15 years old, but uh, no, I'm definitely, definitely a dog guy. Apple or Android? Uh, for phones, Apple, they're a little easier to use for me. I'm not uh, the most techie guy in the world, but uh, for computers, I've had a lot of Apple computers blow up on me, so I, uh, I stay away from that. <laughs> Never a good thing. <laughs> Definitely not. Uh, how about pancakes or waffles? Ooh, I'm more of a bacon and egg and hash brown kind of guy, but if I had to choose, uh, I'd probably say waffles. A morning person or night owl? A little bit of both. It really depends on my sleep schedule and, uh, you know, what I have to do the next day. Because if I get the chance to sleep in, I'm absolutely taking it and staying up late. But uh, I love I love early mornings. So would that make you a morning owl? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I'm a little bit of a hybrid, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I like that. All right. Uh, text or call? It depends on the situation. Um, 
if it's something short enough to be texted to where I can just answer real quick right away, absolutely text me. But if it requires conversation, call me. I cannot stand having, I know I'm not really a, a tech savvy guy, but a, te- a text conversation and people think it's more convenient. You could have picked up the phone and said it in 45 seconds, but you got to go back and forth. That to me drives me crazy. <laughs> you turn 45 seconds into 45 minutes. Yeah, exactly. Warm or cold weather? Cold. I love the cold. I've, uh, I've always been a winter guy. I mean, ever since I had my first winter when I was a kid, I was uh, fortunate enough to have my dad take me up to the snow when I was younger. And uh, moving out to Wisconsin, I, uh, I kind of enjoyed the minus 40 weather and the ice fishing and all that stuff. You're not a true upland California. Like you, you hail from California, but you're definitely got that Midwest mentality, huh? Yeah. I kind of fell in love with the Midwest when I moved towards it. And, uh, Honestly, I haven't uh, haven't gone back. <laughs> Don't. And it's so funny because out here you have so many people that, you know, want the California weather. And here you're from California and you want the uh, the Midwest weather. So it's unique. You know, the grass isn't always uh, greener on the other side. But uh, how about coffee or tea for all these Midwestern uh, cold days? I'm also a hybrid with that. I mean, I love my coffee. I'm drinking some right now. But uh, if the weather calls for it or, you know, I don't have time to make a pot of coffee, I'll just make a cup of tea and uh, relax a little bit. Nice. All right. Next one is hamburgers or hot dogs. You can't beat a good burger. You can't. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. I love my hot dogs, but uh, you know, you get a good burger in front of me. I, you just, you just can't beat it. Just, you, you can. Yeah. You just can't beat it. Especially on the grill. Absolutely. It's gotta be grilled. Oh yeah. Uh, Twitter or Facebook. I'm not much of a Twitter guy. I don't think I've uh, posted a tweet since 2014. So uh, I'd have to say Facebook there. It's okay. I don't even have either one. So you're, you're all right. (laughs) And last one we have is Netflix or Hulu. Netflix. I've been, uh, been with Netflix for years and uh, I got a pretty good deal not having to pay that much. So uh, I'm going to stick with them until uh, they take my shows off. (laughs) Hey, that's, that's a good way to put it. But you had a lot of answers where you had hybrid. Maybe, you know, we'll just have to, that'll be your nickname is, is the hybrid out there, especially <laughs> if you start contributing offensively from the back line, you know, because then it's a, you know, a Henry Berger, that uh, was something he kind of did was be able to contribute offensively from the back line. So um, great stuff. And we appreciate you taking the time, Nick Treffery with us, but anything in, in closing and uh, to wrap this up, that you would like to say to the icebreaker fans out there is hopefully we're about just over a month away from the opening puck drop. Yeah. I mean, reading the comments on the pick and the dispersal draft and everything like that. I mean, thanks for welcoming me. I mean, it's, it's really cool to be welcomed with open arms like this and uh, I'm really fortunate to be here and uh, really fortunate for such a good fan base. Well, Nick, we really appreciate you taking the time to join us here on Into the Depths today, and we really look forward to seeing you on the ice and seeing what you can contribute there as part of the back line for the men or icebreakers. Thanks again for taking some time for us this morning. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Selling your home or buying a new one can be a stressful situation, and it can be hard to know who to trust when trying to find a realtor. Homelight gives you a smarter way to find a trusted real estate agent who will get the best outcome for you. Don't risk hiring the wrong agent. Visit www.homelight.com today. All right, we're here with another front office feature with Icebreaker's Director of Sales, Tim Walker. And Tim, how are you doing? Good, how are you this morning? Doing pretty well. So first of all, just tell us a little bit about your role with the team. Uh, My main role with the team is, uh, you know, reaching out to all the corporations, businesses within the area and getting corporate sponsorship. So, you know, they can uh, lend their, uh, their financial for return of uh, us advertising for them during our games and on our bus, our jerseys, everything. So what does your day-to-day role kind of look like? <laughs> right now it's uh, pretty hectic. Um, normally we have, you know, six months to prepare for a season. Uh, now we have six weeks to prepare for a season. So, it's uh, it's very stressful right now trying to get out to everybody and let them know that we are having a season. We are going to be able to have fans in the seats, uh, even though COVID is still, you know, out there. So talk a little bit about your background. I know you're a product of the Mentor Youth Hockey System. Uh, you were in the Army for a little bit and 20-plus years of experience in your career in the sales field. Correct. Yeah, I, uh, I grew up playing hockey in the Mentor Youth System. Um, as just about anybody that's walked through this rink knows uh, – 
Coach Bill De Benedictus, better known as Coach D. Um, he actually is uh, good friends with my my folks, and uh, he got me into the uh, the program. And from there, I just continued my career all the way through college. Um, so, how did you end up getting involved with the Icebreakers originally? Uh, originally, with the Icebreakers, <laughs> funny story. Um, me and my girlfriend uh, Jessica at the time were having dinner at. Uh, one of our uh, local uh, restaurants, which is Spuddies and Men on the Lake, which is also one of our uh, sponsors. Um, and Nick was sitting next to us, and we were watching hockey on TV, and we got to talking. And I find out that he would have been my head coach at uh, Niagara my freshman year if he took the position. Then one thing led to another, and, you know, we became friends over time. And, uh, you know, the front office here changed dramatically, and, and they offered me the position here. What would you say is the biggest challenge of your job and your responsibilities? Currently is, is going to be COVID. Uh, so many small businesses sponsor us, and they've been hit hard with, uh, with COVID over uh, well, almost a year now. Um, but uh, the only thing I can uh, tell everybody out there is, uh, you know, try to, try to go to your, your mom and pop stores, your mom and pop restaurants, you know, um, try to stay away from the big chains. Big chains aren't hurting. It's the it's the little ones that uh, you know keep uh, the economy going, keep the uh, you know your community uh, well informed. And then, what would you say is your favorite part about your job up to this point? Uh, there's so many dis- different things. Uh, you know, coming in, seeing the players, you know, talking to you know the fan base because everybody's excited about the season going. Uh, we're going to be the only professional hockey team, or excuse me, program playing until. Uh, of what middle of February, I believe. So there's going to be two months of just you know us playing with no one else out there really playing. I know a lot of the other uh, leagues throughout the world are uh, are shutting down because of COVID. And then what are you kind of looking forward to the most about this season? Getting it started, just like everybody else, getting the players in for camp, and getting ready for our home opener. And then what are you kind of expecting your job to look like on game nights? I know everybody's role kind of changes on game nights with just so much going on. Everything's kind of hectic. What do you think your responsibilities are going to be when it's there are actually fans in the stands and a game going on? Uh, there's so many different aspects. Um, you know, I'm going to be making sure, that, you know, we got the merchandise out there so uh, our fan base can buy the new merchandise. <coughs> Excuse me. As well as making sure uh, all of the uh, adult beverages are uh, nice and cold for everybody. You know, shaking hands, kissing babies, so to speak. But now just being out there, saying hi to everybody, making sure everybody's having a good time. And then lastly, just wanted your thoughts on the, kind of the job that Nick Russo and Sebastian Aragno have done this offseason, just building a team under these circumstances. Uh, these guys have done a phenomenal job with, with the circumstances going around. They've been working every day. Um, I know I get calls from Nick and Sebastian Saturdays, Sundays, you know, early mornings, late at nights, it doesn't matter. They don't stop working um, from what I've seen. And I don't get really involved with putting the team together at all, but we do share an office. Um, the, with the amount of players they're bringing in and, and how well these players are, I, I, we got a good chance of uh, pretty much just whooping everybody's butt this year. All right, this is Icebreakers Director of Sales, Tim Walker. And, Tim, thanks for joining us. Thank you. All right, we're joined alongside now by General Manager and Director of Hockey Operations, Nick Russo, for the returning fan mailbox feature. And, Nick, thanks for joining us once again on this Monday morning. No problem, Angelo. I love it. So a lot of interesting questions all across the gamut. We're going to get right into it and answer what the fanatics want to know from you. So what is everyone looking forward to this season beyond actually having a season take place? I think actually getting out of the house and seeing other people. Um, I, I know that's not a hockey answer, um, but just the, the thrill of seeing the boys again. Um, I know that kind of, you know, is hockey related, but um, they're probably looking forward to the new and improved better icebreaker look, um, the new culture that we've created. How soon before a game in a lineup posted? Well, it, it, that's a great question because, you know, you could dress as many guys as you want for warm-up. So sometimes guys are injured and you want to see if they can go. Um, you know, I've had kids uh, skate break in warm-up. 
Um, so basically the lineup is put in right before the start of the game, the final lineup. We're going to get into some uh, meat and potatoes kind of hockey questions. And with your extensive coaching background, it would be great to get your take on. So one fanatic asks, hypothetical situation. You're down by three goals with five minutes to go. Do you pull the goalie, and what might influence that decision? Well, the uh, my my last uh, 15 years, we've never been down by three goals, so thank God for that. But um, back in my early coaching days at you know, Villanova and Newman, y- y- you have to look, one, at the flow of the game. Are you controlling the game? Are you getting 60 shots to their 20, and you pulled the goalie, um, you changed goalies, and you're playing real well. Um, you know, the tempo of the game is key. Do you have a power play? That's also key. Um, if you have a five-minute major, it's definitely key. Um, so those are the things I look for. Uh, three goals down with five minutes left. Um, you know, it's never over, but, you know, you got to get the team to buy into that. Mm-hmm. So you really have to pressure, you know, if you have five guys on the ice or six guys on the ice. Um, they're all forwards. You have one guy that's a defensive defenseman, but he's still offensive. So, uh, you know, again, the, the key is the flow of the game and what the circumstances are as far as the penalties are concerned. So depending on the actual game, different games you'd have a different answer for. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a, it's a flow. It, you know, three goals down and you're being outshot, you know, uh, you know, double, you know, 50 to 25, yeah, yeah, that's, that's going to be tough. Right. No, that makes sense. In an event that you might need to send someone out to make a physical statement, such as a fight or a big hit, what does that conversation look like on the bench? Well, it, you know, it, it, it's a tempo changer, and sometimes it's really necessary. Again, circumstances that lead up to it are important. Like, did, did your captain just get run? Um, you know, are they, are, are they, you know, talking trash? Um, I've always been honest with my players. You know, I'll go to my tough guy and tap him on the shoulder and say, hey, we need to bang things up here or, you know, stir things up. And they know their job. You know, if you're on the third or fourth line and you're, you know, uh, six foot two, 210 pounds and, you know, have fought, you know, every other game, you know, you know the guy to tap. If you have a tight dummy sitting on your bench, and you know what, size doesn't matter. If you have a tight dummy sitting on your bench or, you know, somebody like that, you just go, hey, do your thing. They know what to do. Yeah. Yep. How about give us your best bus trip story? Oh, there's so many. <laughs> um, I've had my bus stolen. Um, wow. I've had my bus parked in in Mass in Boston, downtown Boston. If you ever been there, it's it's crazy. Um, I, I've had it broke down. Um, I think my favorite one was we were coming back from Massachusetts one game, and. Um, the bus driver went under a bridge that was too low and it ripped half the roof off. So the back of the bus, normally vets sit in the back and rookies sit up front. Well, it was snowing so hard. The vets moved the rookies to the back of the bus and the vets were in the front. Literally they were in their snow, snow gear. And we had about four inches of snow by the time we got back to Philadelphia and they were singing Christmas carols and stuff. Yeah, you'll never forget that. No, it was pretty great. It was, uh, well, it was probably lousy for the rooks, but, uh, you know, it was kind of funny because then at one point I believe a snowball fight broke out and the rooks had all the snow. So, you know, they got back at the vets there, but the that, hand, yeah, yeah. that was a pretty crazy road trip. No, that that is a wild one now. What about the toughest barn to play in the FPHL and the toughest that you've had to endure in your entire career? Uh, the uh, the fans will love this. I think the toughest in the FPHL is Elmira. Um, it's the right size. Uh, you know, it's a bigger of the small buildings in the world. You know, three thousand fans. The fans are are just animate. You know, they're they're great fans. Um, great atmosphere. And uh, it's tough. You know, when you get into bigger buildings, like we see right now with pro sports, um, the, 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 it, the crowds aren't there right now in the NFL. You know, like in Buffalo, the Bills Mafia yesterday, non-existent, you know. So uh, uh, sometimes a medium-sized building is, is good, and Elmira's tough. That's a tough place to play. Um, and your Bills had a great game. Oh, they did. Oh, believe Josh me. Josh Allen looked like an all-star yesterday. Believe me. The Browns could have had him. Yeah. Um, 
But the uh, toughest place I've ever had to play, uh, again, we talk about the bus. I've been buzzed that Air Force has a Falcon as a live mascot. And on the bench, I've been buzzed by the mascot. Um, if you've ever been buzzed by a Falcon, it's a little scary. The uh, RIT is always great because there's a bar that connects to the rink. And um, as we know, people do things when they're drinking that they normally wouldn't do. The uh, the best place I would say, uh, the toughest place for me, was Alabama Huntsville, Von Braun Arena. Uh, the 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 um, they sell beer in beer cans, and I learned how to pace because I was always being pelted by full Budweiser beer cans. So you learn to get out of the way quick. You see them coming in your peripheral vision, and I had the trainer keep. Finally, it dawned on me what the heck was going on. So I had our trainer keep picking them up and put them in the cooler. So I had some beers for the hotel after the game. But that's a tough crowd to play in front of. Yeah, that's an agility training test you didn't know you were signing up for. Absolutely. Uh, kind of to tie in a similar question is what makes for a tough place to play? What are kind of the elements? I, I know you touched on a few of them there. but Knowledge of hockey is, is, is key. Uh, that's why I said Elmira. Alabama Huntsville doesn't have the knowledge of the game as much. The um, the size of the building, like I mentioned, the what else is going on in that town? There's not much going on in uh, you know Elmira in the middle of winter. Uh, there is a lot going on in Alabama Huntsville or Air Force or whatever. So what's going on around you? And I think the um, so like they live and breathe. In yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. You get into like Western New York, Southern New York, you know, Michigan, Minnesota. Those people know the game. They're going to they're gonna be involved in the game. You know, it's like I went to a Red Wings game once in Detroit, and they call it Hockey Town for a reason because they're very knowledgeable fans. So I think that adds to it. And um, it's just, again, how tough, how, how tough the fans are, how knowledgeable they are. That's what makes it hard. So uh, this is kind of getting back to maybe putting on your coaching hat a bit. Uh, what is the truer statistical evaluation of a player? Penalty minutes as the gauge of toughness or the plus minus as a gauge of productivity? Well, automatically it's plus minus. And, and productivity is everything because, you know, you have forwards that score goals. You have defensemen that don't. The, the, you know, when you see a defenseman in the plus because they get, you know, more shifts, that's key. Uh, if you see a forward in the plus – um, I love the what, what's the defensive forward, the Salki Award. Um, that's key because it shows the guy who's like Steve Eiserman. He doesn't get the credit that he should because he just is a total two-way player. Uh, there, the the penalty minutes isn't doesn't dictate how tough you are. There's no correlation because you could be a goon and be tough, or you could just take stupid penalties with your mouth. So that doesn't. It's not a true indicator what type of penalty. If you see a guy that constantly, constantly getting fighting majors for and winning those fights, yeah, it's a good statistic. But then, how does it hurt you? As long as you're taking somebody, I say fighting because if they're fighting, they're taking somebody with them. Yeah. When you're tripping and shooting off your mouth, you're going alone. There's an opportunity cost. There's no. Room right. For that. Right. And plus minus is so important. Now we're talking again with the general manager and Director of Hockey Operations, Nick Russo, for the Fan Mailbox. And this is a perfect question for a man in your role. How good of a team does management feel they've put together? I'm very excited. I was sitting here listening to a couple of your interviews today. The uh, talent that we've brought in uh, through the dispersal drafts, the uh, talent we've brought in. If you notice the, the common theme of all the guys you've talked to, they're well-spoken. Mm -hmm. All right, They've played at higher levels. And they are college educated now. Now, some of my best friends are brilliant and never went to college. It's not a direct correlation there. But you're seeing some polished guys with a lot of playing credentials. And hunger. And hunger. I mean, everything I hear out of their mouth is they're excited to be here and mentor. Uh, the, it, that's what it's all about. This team is going to be, uh, Sebastian and I have really focused on uh, a, a higher standard. And I think you're going to see it. I'm very, very excited. So the next couple of questions to uh, wrap up are dealing with the current uh, COVID-19 issues. So how will the team deal with any potential COVID-19 issues? Are we expecting a financial hit? And if so, how will it be dealt with to make sure the team sticks around 
for the coming years? Wow, that's a long question. That is a long question. All right, so I have to actually take a breath in between. Yeah, you did, and I, you know, and you're good, you're good at talking. Um, <laughs> the the situation, the COVID situation, obviously is a constant flowing situation. The hard part is it's not going away; it's getting worse. The our plan as an organization to deal with it, we the league has thrown around some things as potential parameters. We had our medical staff sit down and come up with what would work for us. The we, We've got a safe house, for example. If a player comes down with COVID, whether it's one of ours or the other team, for example, they'll stay here for the two weeks in this apartment where we could fit a couple people. So the world has changed. You know, we wear masks now, and I would laugh because – I laugh because – the guy who's going to rob the bank doesn't wear a mask now so because he doesn't believe that the mask is going to help him from COVID probably. But, yeah, it, it's caused a big financial burden all across the – everywhere. Small businesses are closing. It, it's hurt us. It's hurt Elmira. It doesn't matter the size of your building. If you're not playing – I mean, we're, we're fan-generated. Our revenue is from fans, merchandise, beverage, and sponsorship. Well, if you're not playing, you're not getting any of that. So we've taken a big hit. As far as where we're going moving forward, we you know, we plan on being here. We have no idea what the future brings. We all thought COVID would be over by now, but it's not. Like I said, it's getting worse. The leagues around us, no matter what sport it is, like when the NBA came out and said, you know, December 22nd, they're not going to start December 22nd. I don't know how they can. I mean, baseball and football were one thing because they're outdoor sports. Mm-hmm. Now you get into arenas, okay? That's a, that's an issue. So, you know, and again, it's it's just um, we we plan on being here, but I don't. I'm not Nostradamus, and I don't have a crystal ball. We're prepared for the long run, but you know, and I hope that's the case. But we didn't plan on COVID either, right? And I don't think anyone did. Now, before we get to the next question, um, just for uh, the fanatics out there as well, currently then the plan still is December 18th as far as what's out there, or has that changed? No, that hasn't changed. Um, we have a uh, owner's meeting on the 18th of November where we're going to discuss that again. I believe that it's possible, again, the – the, the new cases are alarming. The election, everybody thought, well, the election would change everything, and those that thought that are on an island because it's not. You know, the agendas, people have told me, well, governors, you know, uh, they had a political-driven agendas. Uh, our governor here in Ohio, and I know Pennsylvania and New York, you know, they, they, they're all different parties. They don't have, they're trying to take care of people and help people. We might not agree with how they're doing it, but, you know, we plan on starting on the 18th. My, I would love to start on the 18th. And that's the current plan. That's the current plan. Okay. And lastly, so, again, obviously COVID's going on, but how people are dealing with the run. So how have players dealt with the other important thing health-wise, staying in shape with the COVID restrictions in place? Well, that's a great question. Whoever wrote that, I'd love them to email me and tell me who you are because that is a great question. it's a great question. So, you know, as a player uh, and a coach, management, my body shuts down the week after the season. It just totally shuts down. And I don't leave the house. I don't leave my bed. Players are like that. Your body's on a clock. A week later, you, you start thinking about, okay, now what do I got to do? So even in COVID, I think guys were, were still – when they get through that initial rest period, you, you, you start working out. You're on your own, really. You got to so, be self-motivated. Yeah, so that doesn't change, especially at our level. This isn't high school or, or, or youth hockey. You know, you're a professional athlete. You it, The days of Babe Ruth eating hot dogs and drinking beer before a game or at, all summer long and smoking cigars are gone. So you, even golf, you look at Tiger Woods, he started it with the golf, you know, the real training, a physical training. So they know, okay, it's time to get in the gym, it's time to get back. And you start out slow, and you get through the off season. What's changed is being on the ice. I, I think that's the meat of the, what this question was. 
you know, the physical conditioning didn't change because you're by yourself usually. What's changed is the the um, like in football the 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 non mandatory practices, um, training camp, training camp, things like that. That's changed. Rinks were closed. That's the problem with COVID. So the good news is most rinks in most states opened up in enough time for these guys to get back on the ice. I mean, some buildings still don't even have ice, even in our own league. So, you know, that was where it changed. So you got to come up with alternate ways to train, you know, whether it be rollerblading, whether it be whatever. But I think, you know, in our sport, most rinks opened up in enough time where the guys train with, you know, for example, if you're home from Notre Dame and I'm home from, you know, you're in college and I'm home from Mentor playing pro, we grew up together. You heard uh, Nick Treffrey talk about burger. You know, you get together with your guys back home and you, you, you work out together on the ice. Uh, so that, that it hasn't changed a whole lot. It just was delayed a little bit. Yeah, you got to like it. Not that he's the only guy doing it, but uh, Ortiz said he had uh... – Finished working out, then he was doing our podcast interview, and then he's going on ice. Yeah, I mean, that, that's that's what today's world is about. You know, you do need the competition, so it's always good to have a couple buddies. I know in this area and, and all, all these guys, they have their network of buddies that grew up in Toledo or, or, or you know, Menor or Avon, you know, on the lake or whatever, and they, they, they train together. Well, that was a great fan mailbox with general manager and director of hockey operations, Nick Russo. Some well-thought-out questions from the Fanatics. And as always, you can submit your questions for Nick for a following and future episode of the fan mailbox. Nick, thank you so much for taking the time to answer these questions for the Fanatics. My pleasure. And looking forward to seeing everybody at the home opener. Well, what in episode seven, we got to hear a lot of different voices here on this episode of Into the Desk with the Men Icebreakers, caught up with General Manager and Director of Hockey Operations, Nick Russo, for the Fan Mailbox. Always fun to answer the Fanatics questions. I know Nick appreciated all of those. We also got to talk to Tim Walker, the Director of Sales for the Men Icebreakers, and learned a little bit more about what he does behind the scenes and his role for the Men Icebreakers. And... We got to talk to two of the newest signees, Nick Treffery and Marcus Ortiz. Yeah, a lot of guests on this episode. I think it was a really, I don't know if the word is revealing, but uh, those two interviews with the two players, Treffery and Ortiz, I think were two of the better ones we've had on the podcast to this point. Don't want to forget that season tickets are available to put a reserve down and you get a guaranteed seat for each home game, 10% off each face value of the ticket, 10% off merchandise, private tick-up event, and special guests on opening night. For more information, please contact the Director of Sales, Tim Walker, at 440-391-3050 or email him at timw at menoricebreakers.com. That's to get your reserve on the season tickets. And that's menoricebreakers.com slash season tickets to reserve your seats. Also, don't want to forget, get your reserve for the Media Guide Keepsake special tab under the team store. Like we said, there will be an extended feature interview with Marcus Ortiz in addition to everything else you'd ever want to have, men or icebreakers from the beginning of the team through up up through now, the current most current icebreakers reiteration, and those will be coming out in December at some point. So put your reserve, no cost to reserve it, right at the Men Ice Breakers team store. There's a special tab for doing so. And I just want to talk about our youth enhancement sessions every Wednesday, 1 p.m. at Men Ice Arena, uh, focused on skill enhancement for all youth hockey players of any age with Icebreakers head coach Sebastian Ragno, and occasionally players also come and help out with those sessions. So sign up your child. That's MenorIceBreakers.com slash enhancement. And thanks again to our new sponsor, Homelight. Remember, no matter how you choose to sell your home, start at Homelight. Just answer a few simple questions, and Homelight will provide you with options personalized for your needs. In addition to prices, verified buyers will pay for your home right now. Get started today at Homelight.com. And until next time, we'll see you all later.